You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Holt. Welcome back to Shoe Radio. It's uh, the Shoe and Show. W Shoe. Is that the call sign now? It's DJ Polk on the radio. I'm having flashbacks of WKRP in Cincinnati. Oh, remember there you go. Show? Exactly. Yep. That was a great show. Yep. I, don't, I don't remember much of it. Lonnie Anderson was on it. That's the only thing I remember. <laughs> you remember the reruns? I do. I like do. One of those family channels that runs all the... Well, they used to run the Cosby Show. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Squash that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, folks, this is the Shoe and Show. We are the Footwear Industries podcast covering all the ins and outs of all things footwear. Just as the lovely voice intro provided to you. But uh, we really try to focus in on business trends impacting our industry. Consumer trends driving... The, uh, the business changes, trade issues, political issues, God forbid. Um, so today we have a legend, an industry legend, we a do. living legend. His name is Ric Flair. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 no, man, we do there have him. I knew it. So that was that that woo that you heard was from Andy Gilbert, who is the president at Genesco for licensed brands. And Andy is one of the few, the proud, not a Marine, but he is the returning guest on Shoe In. And I he he joins the ranks of Cliff Sifford, Matt Powell, nobody anyone else? I don't know. That's the four horsemen right there. Yeah, people the don't industry. really return. So Arne Andy, Anderson. welcome back, my friend. Thank you very much. Good to be back with you guys. Good. So what's happening in Nashville right now? Talk to us about kind of what Genesco through Journeys and through Johnson and Murphy have a lot of got a lot of irons in the fire as a company. What are you guys seeing on kind of the retail side uh, right out of the gate? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, Nashville as a city is on fire. I don't know if you've heard that as of late, Um, but only for me, but, uh, you know, it's great. Uh, it's great to be sort of living in this city, right? We're, we're going through a bit of a renaissance here in Nashville. And I guess we were, you know, I was living in Nashville long before it became cool to be in Nashville, but it's a, it's a great place to live. Um, you know, your question comes at a good time for us. We uh, reported out our second quarter earnings and, uh, and our overall results. And I'll tell you, we, we just had a, a phenomenal second quarter really led by our, our journeys team you know, at a, at a time when, when retail arguably is going through, uh, maybe not arguably, is going through a bit of a transition, um, you know, those retailers who have uh, competitive points of difference in the market or have leading share in the market tend to do really well. And, you know, Journeys is probably a, a great example of where we have a really, you know, solid market position, but where we also have a, a seasoned group of people who live through many, uh, you know, changes in the market dynamic. And uh, I think, uh, you know, that experience has served them well and it's been reflected in sort of their trends over the last uh, several quarters. So uh, their business continues to be, you know, very, very, very good. And then, um, you know, today we have left uh, in our portfolio of companies, we have uh, both the Johnson & Murphy business as well as uh, the licensed brands businesses and uh, and both of those businesses also had sort of a solid uh, uh, second quarter and good earnings results relative to last year. So we feel, you know, pretty good in light of uh, kind of the retail mageddon that's that's taken place you know, in the last year or so. We feel pretty good about about our results and about where we're positioned today and and certainly for the future. Is retail mageddon a real thing in the sense that the- retail mageddon? <laughs> Call sign now. Um, is that a? Re- I dare say it again because you might do that again. Retail again. Retail again. That's hilarious. If you uh, say it twice or three times, it's a real thing. I learned that from Donald Trump. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, but is this? I mean, are your results kind of a, a pushback against that narrative, or are you just making the appropriate corrections to meet consumers where they are through a variety of channels? Is that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I I sort of understand the um, the, the basic intent of the question. I, th- I think 
you know, one of the things that we're learning through these difficult sort of retail times is that those those companies, those retailers who are positioned well, whether they be vertical retailers or whether they be retailers of other brands, um, those that are positioned strong enough uh, tend to do well as capacity comes out of the system. So I think it's a combination of, you know, some of our, our other uh, competitors who have left the market essentially and capacity has come out and the remaining, um, um, you know, retailers who are left in the system that have strength are the ones that are capitalizing uh, on that. Um, I also tell you that, you know, in in the case of our team, you know, at Journeys, they do a phenomenal job, not only on the merchandising side, but also, you know, at point of sale, working directly with their consumers. So, you know, as we've seen, you know, traffic overall uh, tended, you know, tended to decline in the mall environment, you know, over the last several years, one of the things that our team at Journeys, I think is doing a great job of, and our teams at Johnson & Murphy as well, is converting those customers uh, as they as they come in the door. So even though traffic's light, you know, our conversion rates are better, which I think is a real testament not only to the merchandising team, but also to our operations teams on the on the ground. So I don't know if I answered the question, Matt, but you, you know, I think it. all right, good. I know <laughs> I think that tees up that tees up some questions I have for you as well. I read a an interview the other day uh, that Dick Johnson, the CEO at Foot Locker, gave and I thought it was really interesting because we often talk about the mall channel um, kind of uh, like homogeneously, right? It's like the mall and then we, we say, you know, malls are dying as a whole. And his interview was really interesting because he was he he segmented what he what he considered a type malls that were actually growing and the foot the the you know the traffic was pretty good and their sales were growing versus malls that were on the decline um and where they may not actually have foot lockers in anymore or never place them to begin with so it seems like when we talk about malls you know we can talk about overall foot traffic as a whole but we can also talk about I would say every 15 to 20 years, we have these kind of trends with these channels. Right. And I, and I always point out, um, and I did a speech on this and, and showed the video, but the mall that the blues brothers took their cars through and crashed the mall up during their movie was a mall that actually failed and didn't exist. They recreated that. They went and found the set and, and built out the set and had it. So that was like, what was the sixties, right? Um, 60, seventies. Um, so malls then were failing just like they're failing today. So, um, when you guys look at malls, are you guys also looking at different types of malls and, and is the footprint, are you trying to look at how you expand your footprint or be more smart about where you play stores or do stores, et cetera? How do you guys look at that? I, I think it's always about, um, sort of constantly looking at your, your retail portfolio of stores and just trying to identify, where your target consumer, it, you know, is, is is shopping, and just you need to be able to show up that you know in those environments. And in the case of Journeys, you know, we have more than sort of anecdotal evidence to suggest that you know that teen customer that we're going after is still by and large shopping, you know, in malls, whether those be A malls, B malls, mm-hmm. you know, or even some C mall locations. And I would also suggest that. You know, you you can be successful in B malls and C malls, but you have to be able to get the economics right in order to uh, make some of those stores work. The A malls definitely have the traffic, but you also pay for uh, the privilege of of being exposed to that traffic. So, you know, I think Dick's absolutely right. Um, I, I think you just have to be smart about your retail portfolio. You have to constantly be working on it and and refining it to just to make sure that you've sort of optimized your uh, your your economics. Just real quick for our listeners, can you walk through the classifications of A, B, and C malls and what those are? You know, um, I'm not a retail expert, and I don't play one on TV. Uh, but you're but, on the radio. Uh, this is a shoe but I am show, on the, so you can play one here. But I, but I am on the – but but typically your, your A malls are those high-profile, sort of uh, high-traffic – you know, malls, I'd give you a couple of examples would be, you know, like Mall of America, as an example, would be a, an A mall or even locally here in Nashville, you know, Green Hills would be considered kind of an A mall. And typically what happens is you look at some of the smaller regional malls as being those B and C mall locations, largely where, you know, traffic, you know, has has evaporated over time. And so the economics for um, essentially operating in those malls are very different. You tend to pay higher rents 
essentially, you know, per square foot for the A mall locations and, of course, lower rents for the C mall locations. I would, I mean, I worked at a, probably a B or a C mall for many years at the Chick fil A. That's probably it's the C. It's one of the world's largest carpeted malls in the world at Monroe (laughs) Mall. Congratulations, Monroe, number one, once again. Um, But it became one of those things where, you know, if you wanted to go to an A mall, you could drive to Charlotte, but no one really wanted to drive to Charlotte except every so often. So you're exactly right. Those B's and C's get a lot of traffic. And if I and this is tease up my next question, it's really product driven in a certain sense. Right. And I think what's great about Journeys is. You guys are showing product that people want to buy right now. And I had a conversation uh, with someone from Nordstrom the other day, and um, they had a real challenge with product this year. And that's why their numbers are a little bit lower. They didn't get the right product. They didn't get it in on time. They're still working on their channels. But if you walk into a Journeys, there's Vans, there's Fila. You guys are really killing it. And someone once told me, if you have the right product, you can walk around a mall with a, you know, your, your, you know, Nikes in a, in a trash bag and you can sell them out in 15 minutes if you're a good salesperson, but you need the right product. Yeah, no product is absolutely instrumental. And I I will tell you back on the mall conversation for just a moment. um, You know, one of the things that we're finding if consumers are making, you know, less frequent, you know, trips to the mall, when they do make those trips to the mall, those, those trips have to count. And I think holiday is a great example where you see some of those a mall location, a malls, which have a much you know broader range of of retailers and more premium retailers, more value price retailers across the board. Um, those malls tend to get the higher levels of traffic during during those seasons. So, in a, in a lot of in a lot of cases, it's all about you know who who is who's at the mall, right? I mean, who the anchor tenants are and who are the retailers in the mall that really help drive that traffic. But uh, but if consumers are shopping less frequently, which which they are, and they're making those trips less frequently they're going to make those trips count when they do, when they do go to the mall. But to your point on, on product, you know, Andy, it's 100% the case. You know, we, we oftentimes find that it's amazing how the results are always linked to having the right product. If you have what consumers want, you have it at the price they're willing to pay, you know, somehow you tend to get at least your share, if not more than that of the business. And I, again, just want to tip my hat to the, to the team and the merchants at journeys because, you know, the, the team customer, you know, sometimes can be a little bit fickle in terms of what they like uh, what? and what they don't like. And for for those of us who have uh, who have teens at home or have had teens at home, sort of clearly get that. So trying to kind of navigate through that sometimes can be difficult. And and the experience that, that team has, I think, really enables them to stay on top of those those things in a in a, in a positive way. So you said in your in your the answer you just gave that at the price that consumers are willing to pay. And that brings to mind the T word or the D word or the other T word tariffs, duties, taxes, get your minds out of the gutter people. Mm. And so the question comes down to you is how is Genesco viewing the current China trade war, the addition of all these different taxes that were added on September 1st and will be added on, here very shortly again um how how i mean and you have different divisions right you have the license side your side you've got the journey side you got all you got the johnson murphy the the wholly owned um brands that you have kind of how is each of those divisions approaching the tariff question and how are you planning for it and forecasting what the consumer ultimately will pay based on these added costs well we we anticipate all in uh including uh, kind of our uh, the the brands that we bring in and sell third party through our journey stores, um, the impact is going to be you know somewhere in the range of about a a, a a million dollars you know for us this year and largely why that number is low relative to our overall revenue is just that we we tend to sell you know other people's brands through most of our our retail stores and so um, if you think about some of the the biggest and best brands that show up in the teen space. A lot of those have a pretty, you know, solid, uh, diversified, let's say, sourcing base. So, um, but we have already seen uh, price increases being passed through for uh, spring of 2020, even in advance of mm-hmm. of the tariffs. I think, and you know, just anticipating that, at least on the on the brand side, uh, in the case of uh, in the case of Journeys, on the Johnston and Murphy and licensed brand sides, you know, we're more Johnston Murphy is a vertically integrated. Uh, a retailer per se, but they also distribute uh, through a lot of the same wholesale channels that uh, our licensed brands 
uh, team here does as well. And so we've definitely seen uh, some impact as a result of the tariffs. You know, as we know, 53% of the goods that come into the country were impacted by the tariffs in, essentially after September the 1st. And uh, I think most, almost all leather shoes were impacted. So, you know, both Johnson & Murphy as well as uh, licensed brands, um, we sell largely leather shoes. So we are, we are seeing a real impact uh, to our cost of goods, you know, as we go through the remainder of the fall season. And, you know, we're going to absorb those costs uh, in the fall for the most part, but we do and have uh, passed along to our retailers some increased prices that essentially will go into effect around the 1st of, of, of December. So uh, the, the, the impact is real, and I, I, I'm, I really get concerned because of a lot of the, 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 the narrative that's been sort of, um, uh, I guess, driven by the, the White House and, and Professor Navarro uh, is that, you know, the impact of these tariffs are really going to be felt more by the Chinese, and essentially they're going to be paying for the tariffs. And we all know, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of the movement in the currency, that uh, that the real impact of those tariffs are going to be felt by the manufacturers, the folks that are importing the goods, you know, from China. And then, of course, you know, we as both public and private companies have to find ways to pass those costs along. And so those costs are going to get passed along. And I'm afraid that you know, most consumers are not going to feel the impact of these costs until we get into uh, really spring of 2020. And then it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens relative to, uh, you know, inflation as a consequence of these tariffs, you know, going up. Um, we we are hopeful, and somebody once told me that hope's not a strategy, but we are hopeful that, uh, you know, as the, the negotiations with the Chinese progress, that, you know, we'll see a, a rollback of those, of those tariffs. But I think, you know, as a business uh, and as managers of business and, and folks that are you know, obligated to shareholders to to do our fiduciary obligations, we have to plan for the eventuality that, um, you know, that those tariffs never come off, and so we're having to pivot and shift our supply chains as a result. I think it, I think that's well said because I think the the biggest concern that we have as well with uh, Professor Peter Navarro, um, who's coming from uh, an ivory tower with academic theories and trying to put them in place. Um, in ways that we haven't really seen before for, for, you know, decades and decades in the form of, of new tariffs and the disruptions of that cause. I mean, if we just think about small interest rate adjustments by the fed here and there and how much of an effect that has on our economy, we're trying out things that we haven't seen again for decades and decades. And we don't know how that's going to play out both in terms of inflation, uh, inventory, whether people start pulling back, whether people want to pull back on spending, how that impacts consumer sentiment. It's already impacting manufacturing sentiment. Um, and we've seen pullbacks on that. It's impacting the markets and the bonds where we've seen inversions happen. Um, so even talks of some of this stuff creates real confusion. And I guess, you know, you really covered well the, the quantitative part of what the costs are for tariffs. But Let's talk a little bit more about what that means for planning, um, because I think people don't realize it's not just that you're paying more. It's that there's new systems you're trying to put into place to become more innovative and to make sure you touch your consumer better and make sure it's a better experience. And on the on the back end operations, when you're designing and developing new product, you're trying to, to, to purchase new systems or new software or any number of things that help you speed up um, your processes and trim out costs. What is that doing for your planning on that? Are people kind of in limbo where they're like, at one point we would, you know, definitely spend and have a budget for doing this and, and are increasingly maybe not just necessarily, but more, more broadly from your business background. Do you think people are just kind of sitting on cash right now in investments and just holding back to see what's going to happen? You know, I, I, I think, you know, from, from my view, um, given the, the sort of, even though the, the tariffs have been signaled for some time, the sudden nature in which they sort of were dropped in there uh, in, in the 1st of September, um, I think it's got a lot of the industry, you know, reeling, just trying to, you know, get their supply chains organized to make sure that they have, you know, a, a profitable flow of, of merchandise and of goods coming from the various sources. You know, as, as you guys have articulated in you know, in many of the shoe and shows and, and, and on television and many of the, the talk shows that you guys have been involved in some of the interviews, 
I mean, to move the supply chain out of out of China is very, very complex, just given the capital, you know, involved in in you know buying and operating machinery, and then of course all of the other uh, you know resources and infrastructure that's in place in China that that's needed to be replicated in other markets in order to source products there has made you know just the 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 moving of seventy percent of the imported footwear in this country uh, it's made it very complicated, and so I think. You know, um, some companies got well ahead of it and, and started down the process of diversifying from China. But still, you know, when you look at 70 percent of the goods coming into this country are still coming from China, as a lot of companies, I think, that are that are scrambling to a large degree uh, just to get their supply chains organized. And, you know, un- unfortunately, what it what it does mean from an innovation standpoint is I think you know, we're always constantly looking at ways to try to innovate. But if you have to think about priorities right now, given the, the tariffs that are in place and the threat of continuing tariffs, what we have to do first and foremost is just make sure that we have our supply chains organized in such a way that we can guarantee continuity of, you know, of, uh, of supply uh, for ourselves and, 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 and for our customers and not sacrifice, quite frankly, you know, quality. Um, because there are some out there that are trying to sort of work around the edges of these tariffs by, you know, taking essentially content out of the product and delivering at the same price. But at the end of the day, you know, you start to really threaten, you know, the relationship that you have with the consumer if you if you start to, to sort of take things out of the product. So um, to me, Andy, I think, you know, our, our biggest issue, you know, as an industry is just making sure that we get our supply chain set so that we can ensure that we have continuity. I've been blown away, Andy, by the frenzy of activity that one tweet can can create in the in our industry and i assume in just about every other consumer good industry uh and there's just so much that goes into the you know i just remember when the tweet had come out august 1st and and companies were but the list had not yet come out and companies were already trying to negotiate with their factories about about reductions of 10 percent or five percent or whatever the number was uh, then finally the list comes out just a handful of days before it takes effect and then it, it gets bumped up 10 to 15 percent and just watching anecdotally and talking to sourcing execs about what it takes to kind of maneuver that has been has been just mind-blowing to me what one <laughs> man, one man can do um but, trader gedman <laughs> <laughs> but um Speaking of frenzy of activity, as we close out this portion of our discussion, let's talk holiday. Um, how are you guys feeling about the holiday season in spite of the tariffs, um, in spite of cost increases? How's it, how are your consumers feeling about it? And should we be bullish about it? Should we be bearish? Are we Should we feel good about it? What are your expectations for holiday? You know, I, I think as an as a as an industry, we feel like you know, given all the economic indicators that we see out there, just generally speaking, that consumers, you know, are in pretty good shape, you know, for this coming holiday. We'll we'll see, you know, how the retail pie gets divvied up at the end of the day, where they decide to spend that those discretionary dollars I hope when it it's comes down. Pecan pie. To, I, w- I want yeah, some pecan man. pie over the holidays but, for sure, or pumpkin um, from Cracker Barrel. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, uh, but we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see where the consumer, you know, decides to spend their money. I think with respect to, you know, Junesco, we, we feel, you know, very good about um, our overall uh, assortment of product and our brands. Um, you know, we've been, you know, it's no, no secret that we've, we've run, you know, eight or nine consecutive quarters of comp store growth. So we're running up against some pretty, you know, healthy, um, you know, comp stacks from previous years. But despite that, even in our second quarter that we released, um, you know, our comps continue to be very, very good. So you know how it is in retail, right? When things are good, you believe they're going to be good for a very long time. and things are bad, you think they're going to be bad forever. Um, but but I would just say, uh, based on the job that our, our merchants have done uh, and the product assortments and the, the partnerships with a lot of the key brands and that combined with our results and a robust consumer environment, you know, we, we feel like that we're going to get, you know, our share for, uh, you know, for holidays. So we, we, we feel okay. There's, we, we're not, you know, we're cautiously optimistic. Hmm. That's great. I'm glad, you know, it's good to hear some positivity. We've been talking about a lot of negative stuff lately, uh, around trade. So it's nice to hear. And I agree. I think right now our economy is going pretty well. Uh, people are a little bit, you know, people are a little bit, they got some fear right now about what's happening. But let's say there's some negotiation that, that that breaks through and all of a sudden 
these tariffs go away, I mean, that all of a sudden it frees up, you know, it, it reduces those costs that we've been talking about. Then all of a sudden it creates more certainty um, around business cycle. And so, I mean, we're, <laughs> it's kind of really interesting. We got this one person controlling all these different channels right now. Um, and it's the way it is. Uh, people voted for him and that, you know, it's, yep. it's what we have to deal with and we'll see what happens in 2020. Um, I'm always, you know, one thing though, if I open my own retail store, I would call it shoe hostage. And here's what I would do. I would do what they do in Asia when you go to one of those little markets and you walk in and you want to see a bag. They they take you to the back and they shut the door and it's like, buy it or not, right? Mm -hmm. I would make a sale every single time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my lawyers would like it. Well, I'm not sure, but I think they have laws against operating that way in the United States. I'm well, that's not, why I would call it I'm shoe. <laughs> that's why I call it shoe hostage, so they would know if they walk in. I mean, there's full disclaimer. What's that place in Myrtle Beach where they like yell at you and call you terrible names if you order I think burgers? It's dicks, right? Yeah, on yeah. The water? yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's similar. <laughs> you can, you like can that. set up shop right next door. Yeah. Well, people you know, said they wanted experience. You know, they didn't say what kind of experience they wanted. That's true. You know, Andy, um, but you do you you do raise the point about you know what happens if the tariffs go backwards, and mm-hmm. you know I think while that might you know provide you know some level of certainty and some level of relief to the market, I think most manufacturers would agree that it's going to be awfully hard, you know, given the way things have been the last several years to 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 go backwards, meaning to to then starting to look back to China as a, as a resource. I think to some degree, you know, some of that manufacturing is going to leave China and it's going to be gone, you know, forever. And once, once we've gone through the the pain of diversifying the sourcing base, I'm not sure that we're going to go back there. And that, Uh, that creates all sorts. And we, Andy, you and I have talked about this because you've pointed out before, as people start to line up at the door at Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, all these other places, the costs there are increasing. Totally. Yep. Yeah, and it's and I wanted to comment on that too. You know, and 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 you know, most of us who've been in the footwear industry for a long time has seen sort of the chase for low cost labor happen. You know, over the last twenty five or, or thirty years. Uh, but what's unique about this particular situation is that when you think about where most of the manufacturing is done in China, a lot of southern China and northern China um, is is in footwear production. It's if you couple that with the mass exodus by all industries out of China hmm. and then those industries essentially um, moving to, you know, other countries where they have the, the workforce to be able to manufacture the products, whether those are electronics or any other type of good apparel, et cetera. Now suddenly it's, it's, it's not just our industry on the ground in those markets that are competing for the labor. In fact, it is, it is all of the industries that were manufacturing, you know, in China that now have diversified their supply chains that are competing for that same labor. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, to me, it's an issue that sort of compounds itself. And, and the perverse part of all of this is that, you know, we're essentially running from China to these other markets in order to save ourselves a few bucks on the tariff side, but it's being offset by uh, the dramatic increase uh, in, in costs that are coming from these factories based on just simple supply and demand factors for, for the labor. So, you know, one isn't necessarily going to equal uh, uh, lower costs out of those markets. Uh, and so, you know, my big concern about where the economy is headed, and I know a lot of people talk about, you know, re- recession on the horizon, but suddenly, you know, those household goods and those products that we buy every single day that come out of China and other markets are going to go up regardless of whether the tariffs come hmm. come off. Or not. So it's just a, a yeah. it's just we're kind of in an interesting spot and nobody knows the future, but, uh, you know, my, my sense is as we roll into spring, we're going to see some, some, some healthy inflation numbers. That's a, so that's a great point. Andy always brings much wisdom and keeps me out of jail on my hostage time, ideas. But, time. uh, but I mean, we heard, we heard the same thing on, uh, from Mike Pisa from apex who does yeah. air freight. And he was yep. like, if you're doing something in Cambodia, you basically got to air freight it out if right. you want it in time, right? right. So there's, yep. it, and he said the same thing. You're you're fighting against electronics. It's not just shoes right. on, on our airplanes. It's everything else. And I think to Andy's point, we this may be the turning point from what we've seen over the last twenty years of real deflation in product. Right? You can buy a TV yep. now 
a 40 inch TV for two hundred dollars. Right. Like, that that was unheard yeah. of in the eighties. It'd be like thousands of dollars. Forty two right? inch was sixteen hundred bucks. I got it in two thousand and six or seven. Right. So six. in ten years, it's decreased that much. Right. And not just on that, but a, prices haven't really increased on a lot of other goods. Right. Right. No, so you're you're. Raising- you, you raise an excellent point, and we were just looking at a, um, some data this week where you look back over the last 10 years and you look at you know where the real inflation has been for consumer discretionary income, and we know that you know it's been healthcare and food and housing and, and, and also education, but you know apparel and, and, and footwear uh, as a result of our ability to chase lower cost labor around the around the planet has been fairly static, and so if you you believe now that 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 sort of has come to an end, um, you know, that that inflation that we've been feeling in some of these other other discretionary categories, if you start to add, you know, footwear and apparel and some of these other classes to that, then suddenly inflation becomes a, a real factor. So it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting to sort of see as we roll over to the first part of the year um, what happens. But, mm. you know, I still maintain with all this sort of <laughs> doom and gloom that we're talking about here relative to uh you know tariffs and and retail and all that, but I think the, the the retailers, the merchants that are positioned the best, despite you know all of these challenges, at the end of the day, um, will not only survive but will thrive in uh, in those environments. So, awesome. Well, with that, let's bring in Jasmine because we just had you know the most unfashionable conversation about tariffs. I thought it was awesome. It was great. I love it, baby. But we need to sprinkle in some Jasmine and. So Jasmine yes. is here with her world-famous fashion, footwear, and focus segment. Um, so I've noticed that, um, you know, ever since Trump has been in office, like, if, like companies and brands have had to, like, you know, put out statements about, you know, their how they feel about social issues right. or, like, you know, support different associations and nonprofits. And I started to see, like, slowly more and more brands start to do that in their shoe. Like, I know, remember Nike had something, and they might have pulled it but you know the Betsy Ross yeah um, they did pull it yeah. okay Betsy Ross on the back of the shoe and I'm not really sure what that was trying to promote or if it was just celebrating like Labor Day or something like that I wasn't sure um, and then I know Converse in the past has done like um, celebrating pride and doing like a um, at the bottom of the sole doing like a rainbow right. um, there's a woman named Jazare who's a blogger who did a collaboration with Reebok and she has like um, a note about single moms in the bottom of the insole so everybody is like doing something with a purpose right but i don't know if this is like old or new and have you ever bought a shoe to kind of like make a statement like that i don't think i ever have besides oh does this look pretty and i'm going with it yeah i i never have that i can think of it's always colorway or function or necessity i think that's why there's so it's like low product run it's almost like a marketing effort in some ways like not saying that they don't believe in the value right right but it it's a low quantity that they're right. actually trying Micro-targeted to Micro-targeted, low yeah. quantity. It goes back into the diversification of product, yeah. I, I would think. Andy, yeah. what do you think? Andy, Andy Gilbert? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? I, I tend to agree with that. You know, I think can, consumers by and large, you know, base their decisions, you know, on their on their on what they want to wear in terms of footwear based on what they think looks good, you know, on their feet and, and what works on a variety of different um, sort of wardrobe applications, right? But with respect to you know, very specialized and targeted types of, of product introductions. I think that's a very narrow slice. That's people that are incredibly passionate about a particular event, a cause that will engage and 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 buy that product. And I, I think you're going to see more and more companies yeah. do more of that, Jasmine. But I think it's going to be you know very specifically targeted to certain consumer groups and consumer groups that happen to be sort of core or central to, to, to their to their brand or their brand position. I will say this. I, I did an interview with Cliff Sifford, the FN CEO summit in, in Miami this earlier this year. And I asked him, do you always have to stick your neck out there for these things? Can you just sell shoes to right. every race, religion, and creed and gender out there? And he was like, absolutely. We 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 don't stick our neck out on anything because we just want to sell people shoes. Yeah, and that's more my mo. Like, I think I kind love of all, serve all, shoes. send shoes yeah. to everybody. Don't carve out these special things. But, yeah, but I don't run a shoe hey, company. Matt. So. Hey, hey Matt, we love everybody. That's okay, right. we love everybody. We we want to sell everybody shoes, no matter sort of 
um, how they view different things, whether those be political issues, social issues. We just want to sell people the best possible footwear that we can. And that, that's what our sort of mission and mantra is. We're, we love everybody at the end of the day. The shoe industry loves green, right? So if, you're, if we, your paper's green and your, and your card's plastic, come on in. That's right. We got a shoe yeah, for you. I mean, no matter, no matter where you stand, you can always alienate 50% of the, of the population. We try not to alienate anybody. Good, good way. Good answer. That's right. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your wisdom and your insights. Uh, it matters a lot to, uh, to help other people in the industry kind of level up to that level and, and think a little bit more critically. So thank you very much. No, it's, it's listen, it's my, uh, my pleasure. Really appreciate being on with, uh, with you guys. Any, anytime you, uh, you feel like you, you, you need some, uh, some, some wisdom from sunny Nashville. So hey. happy to share my thoughts. And we should, I should plug this at the end and it's shameless and I am shameless and I, that's fine. But Andy Gilbert is the membership chair for FDRA. So, Andy, if there's someone out there that's not a member of FERA, what would you say to them? We need you to be part of this team, and you need to be part of this team. The, the, the issues that uh, FDRA is advocating you know, on behalf of its many members are critical to our success today, uh, tomorrow, and for the foreseeable future. And if you're not on board with this organization, uh, you really need to get on board. <laughs> thank you andy it's always fun to talk to you thank you so much folks this is the shoe and show it's the footwear industry's podcast we cover everything about the footwear industry related to business we try to interview all the leaders spread best practices and tips so that our industry can strengthen uh, and grow together if you have ideas for topics and issues that we should talk about or guests that we should have on our show, please drop us our line. We're at shoeandshow.com. Make sure you subscribe either on iTunes or on any anywhere you can get a podcast. Um, and until next time, thank you for listening. And Shoein is out. Shoein has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.